Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is a game from the Chess Masters final in Bilbao, round nine between the world's number one player, Magnus Carlsen, and uh, the world chess champion, the current world chess champion, Vichy Anand. Carlsen on the white end, kicking off with e4, Anand choosing the Sicilian after knight f3, d6, and to bishop b5, bishop d7, we have the Canal Sokolsky attack. And with the elimination of that light square bishop, white will now do well to, well, white will do well to coordinate their only, re their remaining bishop and their pawns. And that's done by having pawns on light, and this guy, of course, will be around to guard dark. Knight f6, knight c3, and one thing to point out, playing the black side, what black would like to get in pawn break wise is either d5 or b5, but with the insertion of c4 on white's fifth move, d5 becomes that much more difficult, of course, to get in. Two pawns now controlling or contributing to the control of d5. So more development, black going with the king side feeding Keto, and white pressing forward with d4 because really uh, the d-pawn is a liability. Or as, uh, as long as it's around, it's just, just a liability. It's backwards at this point right here. So d4 looks to eliminate an unhealthy pawn for a perfectly healthy black c5 pawn. And that's exactly what we have. Cd, knight d, bishop g7. f3 reinforces e4. It also rules out any maybe potential knight g4 ideas, assuming that white would maybe develop the bishop to e3. This is a common idea to rule out knight g4. Queen c7, the start of putting, okay, first directly putting pressure on c4 and potential for both b6 and a5 ideas. This is a weakened diagonal since f3 has been played and uh, the queen could maybe do well uh, on that b6 square. Uh, well, uh, the other way to view it is really the only, the only reason she was on d7 was just to recapture. Uh, we didn't have the knight recapturing his... His, his main square is going to be on c6. So she's just repositioning at this point on c7, hitting at c4, and with b3, okay, now we have actually a couple diagonals weakened. You can see the queen playing to either one of those squares. a5 is made use of right away, hitting at c3. White defends and develops. Knight c6, development, development on the white end and the black end, both sides now castled. One thing that's very important to take note of is that if white does not have this knight to a4 move in response to black's queen b6, for example, instead of castle right here, if black played queen b6, this is a must move. White is needing to play knight to a4 to kick this queen off of the diagonal because we have an instance here with queen b6 that this knight is now not only in a pin but also unprotected. It is hit twice and defended once, in my eyes, it's unprotected, and this is often a very difficult pin to get out of, but there is this resource of knight a4. If it wasn't there, if it was the case that only knight on c to e2, or I should say just knight to e2 was the only move played, well, white is simply lost after e5. But uh, we don't have that, but something, again, certainly to be aware of. You need to know how to be responding. You need to have knight a4 available. So black castles, Knight c to e2, getting in a position to recapture with maybe the bishop, if knight takes, or even the queen, and then there would be a more direct view of that g7 square. Uh, if instead of, let's say, knight to e2, if we did have, uh, let's say, something like rook to c1, after knight takes, queen takes, okay, now maybe there's some tricky stuff that can happen. The knight is able to move, and okay, the queen is getting hit directly, and she has to react. It's just to sidestep that type of uh, possibility that black would have to unleash a, a direct attack against that queen. You'll note that after knight here, if we did have this capture and the queen recapture as well, the knight, of course, can't be making use of d7 unless they want to fall for a mate in one. So we don't have that. After knight on c to e2, we have rook d8, rook on f to d8, bishop c3, kicking the queen away to b6. White gets out of that pin immediately. And now we have the surprising uh, d5. Uh, this certainly caught me off guard. I thought if d5 was going to be played, well, you, you have to kind of prep that with first e6 and then do d5. But it's available. This d5 move is available 
tactically. Uh, if white is to capture with either pawn, let's just say the c pawn, uh, there is knight takes d5, and after, let's say, the recapture, we have rook takes, and now this knight is hit how many times? One, two, three. It's hit four times. It's only defended three, and you can't add a fourth defender. And even if you could, you're getting hit a fifth time or even a sixth time. This knight, however you slice it, is going down. So how, how it might follow if this was the situation, if this was the continuation, the queen maybe would get out of the pin, and at the end of the day, after the smoke clears on this d4 square and the material has been restored, black is still, of course, the side that stands better because all their pieces are working. Dominance of the d file and already in this heavy piece, this strictly heavy piece endgame, black has already a flight square for the king and white will be needing to uh, expend a move to do that for their side. So black would be clearly better in that end game. I don't know if it would be enough to win, but uh, white has something much better than to just go ahead and grab on d5. And what's tried is knight takes c6, knowing that if queen takes, now you take on d5 because there's not the liability. The, the reason that that tactic worked was because white had a, a piece on d4 that was vulnerable, that was caught in a pin, but it's no longer there, so there's no longer a tactic. So we wouldn't have queen takes, that is not the move that was played, instead b takes knight, and now white gets out of the pin and threatens a skewer, bishop a5. Black meets that with rook d to c8. Now we have a structural change with e5, kicking the knight away to e8, and I believe that is the better of the two squares. Uh, you come to the edge, you're getting killed with g4, the knight is out of squares. So uh, e8, I believe, is the better of these two squares because if you go here, e6 is the continuation, however you slice it. Uh, it is the move that's played in the game, and now with e6, black has less options since it's coming with tempo on the knight. Knight e8 was played, and after e6, okay, now at least there's some choice. Maybe black could be playing f5. It's not the move that was played. I'm not sure, well, I'm not sure how much resistance can really be put up after f5 because with this pawn still around, one thing that's popping up in my mind is the potential for maybe a rook adding to d7 and really being able to rely upon that square uh, for a good amount of time. For if it's ever captured, well, uh, we're probably just going to be having uh, the pawn recapturing and okay, just a single step away from queening, that's very critical, very, very dangerous for black to be in. Uh, this type of situation to have a white pawn with such depth on that e6 square. So uh, Anand just grabs it, is up a pawn, but clearly this guy is liability, and so too is his uh, is his friend right here on the e file as well on e7. Both of these guys on the e file are vulnerable. Uh, additionally, now there's tension between these bishops. There's two things going on with that pawn advance. It's weakening the king side for one and welcoming the dark square bishop exchange, which white will be looking to exploit very soon. And it seems like it might be a difficult thing to get in some sort of a, an attack against the black, the black king with so limited pieces, but it's, uh, it's pretty impressive to see uh, just how effective a queen and knight tandem can be. Uh, knight f4 pressure on e6 twice, and bishop takes, queen takes, d4. This is a passed pawn, and this should have some of your attention right now, just a few steps away, but he's not really going to pose any serious threat right now. Okay, hitting the queen. She bumps back to d2. I thought queen e1, just to uh, be assured that this pawn is going to be taken, but Carlson is thinking uh, about something much different. With queen d2, her focus is on h6, and the knight's focus is going to be on g5, and this is going to cause black a serious problem. If the queen can get on h6 and the knight can get on g5, there's going to be uh, black is going to be placed in a giant knot and constricted in a, a really really great way. So let, let's see how that happens. First, first things first, after queen d2, Anand takes the time out to play c5 having now connected pass pawn and providing lateral support to e6. Rook on a to e1, the pawn is hit for a second time, 
It's defended for a second time, and now g4. What is this doing? Primary reason, box out the knight. Uh, I guess uh, more long term, okay, there's a potential for a flight square. This might strike uh, many as being uh, a very committal move, but there's really not a way to exploit the now uh, more weakened nature of, let's say, the, the white king position. I, and I don't even know if you would really go as far as saying it's more weakened. Maybe it's, maybe it's just better off. It's just, you know, going to be a flight square. Um, we see this maybe most commonly, this idea of a pawn constricting a knight when, let's, let's say, uh, a white pawn plays to c3 and the knight is on its classical c6 square. That similar thing occurs in, in, in that position. Uh, let's say, okay, in, the, in this situation, in this game, we have what? We have the knight on g7 and a pawn on g4. There's exactly two squares uh, separating them, and oftentimes uh, that pawn will be doing a good job in restricting the knight. Uh, there's one famous game, I believe it was 1994, uh, Kasparov versus Shirov, where it was a Veshnikov Sicilian, and there was actually an exchange sacrifice. And at the time, we had, for those of you that remember that game, there was a knight, Shirov's knight was on b7, and after there was that exchange sacrifice, we had the follow-up of b4, again, doing a similar thing, having a pawn restricting that knight. So we see this pop about in this game as well. It's just projected on the king side of the board, and maybe one might reason the more critical side of the board, since that's where the kings are both residing. But, uh, okay, we, we just see some... Instead of the queen side in that kasparov Shirov game, we have it being on now the king side. Anyhow, the knight is boxed out. Maybe that's the better way to state it. <laughs> okay, uh, rook c6. Uh, okay, some defense to that e6 square. And, okay, now we have that uh, coordination going on. Okay, the idea is queen h6, and then the knight wants to get to g5. Knight e8, queen h6, knight f6. The knight is not going there. He's, he's making this uh, journey so that he could be in a position to watch over h7. He's really going to be the most convenient piece to meet the eventual pressure against h7, devoting uh, a three-point piece, the, the piece that's of uh, least value, to defend that h7 square. Knight f6, knight g5, and okay, these guys are, well, he's def he definitely can't move. If he moves, it's a mate and two, take, and then f7, game over. With d3, Anand is trying to stir up some trouble with uh, the rook coordination because if something is not done quickly white white's plan is very very clear pile up on the weak link and the weak link is e6 for example let's say after a5 we could just be having rook e5 with the idea well actually, there's two ideas here not only to double on the e file but there is a uh, a slick little tactic that is uh, available after the rook pivots on e5 which i'll point out in a second but Assuming that black does not do something with this d-pawn right away, white's plan is very clear, pile up on e6, and it's very difficult to defend. So a5 is not played. Instead, it is d3. White still plays rook e5, and here is the tactical shot. If, let's say, the rook, let's just say a5 is played here, knight takes h7 is the tactical idea. Knowing now that if knight takes knight, you grab the pawn with check. If the king goes in the corner, it's mate and two. Rook h5, mate next on h7, uh, pick your favorite way to do it. So that's the threat, and it's met immediately. After rook e5, it's met with king h8. So now if knight takes, the knight can recapture, and if the queen takes the pawn, it's no longer coming with check. What this means is that black now has time to get the rook involved to help out with the defense of the knight. So we don't have knight takes h7 after king h8. Instead, rook d1, looking to just pick up this pawn, and there's not a way to, to defend it. Uh, this rook is really not the greatest piece in the world. It's on a closed file. It's having to just babysit a pawn, and neither black rook can even make progress on the d file. Neither one could be in a position to watch over d3 because of knight f7 stuff with the check, and the knight would be hitting at both d8 and d6. So what do you do in this position? Queen a6 is tried. 
in order to meet rook takes d, of course, with maybe rook takes a. Um, but there's no rush, and that's important to recognize in this position. There's absolutely no rush with taking a3. First, just a very common idea in a chess game, react to your opponent's threats first, and your threats will still be persistent. a4, what do you do now? Well, in this game, Anand resigned. There's absolutely nothing to do. Black is in a giant knot, and if you look at the, all the black pawns that black has, none of them can move Okay, except for this guy, but however you slice it, he's going to be taking he's going to be taken on the next turn. Uh, what can you even do in this position? Rook b8 might be a try, but okay, you just grab on d3. Neither well, th this rook. One thing to also point out, looking at how restricted black is, this knight can't move. There's no black pawns that can move. This rook is constrained to this back rank. The, the queen and rook are constrained to the defense of e6. And soon enough, we're just going to be having a third piece hitting at e6. And white is ready to take with maybe the knight or even the rook. And there's going to be absolutely no defense. One thing that I was thinking about was why not, let's say, play rook here, rook to b8 and after rook takes d to play queen c8 and the idea behind that is to now meet let's say rook to d rook on d to e3 with rook to b6 white would still have something in this position in the form of something like a5 and now these rooks are in a giant giant knot keep in mind again that there is no uh, rook d7 shuffling the rooks are basically immobile at this point but it's something much worse than that Really, the idea here is that the queen can't even come back to the c8 square to defend against e6 because we would have the tactical shot rook d8 again with this idea of a knight fork. And after the smoke clears, okay, black has for the queen a knight and a rook, but really don't even view it like this knight is on the board. He's really just a spectator and is restricted just like those rooks were. Every advancing square is ruled out, the knight is boxed out, and there is no potential whatsoever for a fortress in this type of an endgame. So as it stood in this game, after the calm, uh, the very patient a4, recognizing that black has nothing better to do, um, well, black has just absolutely nothing to do, and white will be picking up this pawn on the next turn, uh, Black just ends up resigning. So uh, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye.